you were like already giving it up and I was telling you to continue. Sorry, it just didn't make any sense. Mike, thanks so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me, man. Congratulations on Dear Evan Hansen, the show of the uh, year, my friend. Thanks, yeah, what we is that? So. What is that like for you to be a part of the Broadway show of the year, considering this show has been a part of your life now for two, three years, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, to be with the show for so long and to see it come into fruition the way it has and have it have the success that it has, it's uh, very exciting. It's very rewarding and we're just happy to do it. Eight shows a week, yeah. Eight shows a week. Eight shows That's a week. That's a lot. Yeah, it is. <laughs> take, take me back to the be, to the beginning, to your audition. Did, what did you know about the show? What did you know about the creators? What did they tell you? Yeah. Um, I knew nothing about the show. Uh, they, uh, when I was auditioning for it, they gave me two sides, two scenes from the show that no longer are in the show. Um, they didn't give me the script at all. They asked to me to sing whatever I wanted to sing. So I sang 16 bars of yesterday from the Beatles. The whole thing lasted maybe 10 minutes and that was kind of it. And I knew that evening they called my agents and they're like, yeah, we want him. Why yesterday? Pfft, I don't know, it was the only thing I knew, I like, <laughs> think, really. You were unprepared and you are like, uh, yeah, uh, yesterday. Yeah, like, probably. Um, no, yeah, it was really, I'm, I wouldn't, I'm not, wouldn't consider myself such a strong singer and it was really the one song that I felt comfortable with doing, so. Um, you, you, but you've been in musicals before. Yes. But you wouldn't consider yourself a strong singer? No. Then how do you, how do you keep landing these parts? You know, I keep fooling everyone. Uh, I really have no idea. It works you're, out. You're fooling, like, pretty important people. <laughs> yeah, I guess so, you know? Everybody, they keep hiring me. I don't know. It's, it's their prerogative, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> now, you said, uh, I read an interview with you where you said, you know, then they gave you the script. It was about 200 pages, right? Yeah. What did that What did that first script look like? What was the story of Dear Evan Hansen at that point? Um, well, you know, the way that the writers, uh, Stephen Levinson, our book writer, and Ben Pasek, Justin Paul, our uh, singer-songwriters, um, the way that it was kind of broken down was there were full-fledged, it was a full-fledged play, the way that it was written out, and then um, with... Oh, like no songs in it? Or there anything? were songs in it, but it was it was not interwoven as much as it is now in like in a true musical sense it was a full scene and then like a song or there were lyrics to maybe where a potential thing could be um and you know we really we really had no idea what it was going to be um and it started out in a place uh that was uh way more a lot more satirical than it is now i think um when they first came up with the idea for the show they were really um poking fun at a generation of today. And then slowly and surely they started, when I think what a great play does is they started to ask a question, which was when a tragedy happens, uh, why does it, why do we, you know, as a community and as people take on that tragedy and make it about ourselves in a way. Right, it's easy to watch from the outside and be like, and be cynical and be like, oh look, these people are capitalizing on a tragedy for personal gain, but then it takes that extra step to go, well, why are they doing that? And what makes this person do that? Yeah, and they also explore and show, I think, the positive aspects that come out of it, you know, and how, you know, in times of tragedies, we do need that human connection to, you know, really do feel like we are, you know, from the same kind of earth, you know, in a way. What was, uh, what was your character like in the original sort of satirical version what, compared to what he's like now? Um, you know, uh, that first reading um, and couple readings, uh, Connor was a kind of taunting Evan for the sake of taunting Evan. Um, and then when he leaves the show, he, he never came back again. And then... Um, so you really, you, 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 you pushed yourself in there. You're like, no, I think I should come back more. <laughs> like, maybe I'm just on stage all the time talking to him. No, what happened was I fooled them enough where they're like, oh, let's give them more material, you know? <laughs> um, no, they, they, and then... Let's give them a song. <laughs> yeah, um, no, they, they, it's, it goes hand in hand with that. They started asking the questions as to why is he the way he is? And then they, you know, started adding... Um, some things, and then they brought on this aspect of, you know, what if uh, Evan's imaginary friendship with Connor actually did play out in a way, and, uh, you know, they have full-blown conversations, and what would that be like, and what if we gave Connor a song, and like, you know, and what would it be if Connor kept pushing Evan to keep going with this, with this lie, and, um, 
Yeah. Well, it's this interesting element where in passing or, you know, in someone's death, we can begin to imagine the person that we would have wanted them to be, whether we knew them or not. And it's what Evan starts doing. He didn't really know him, but he starts sort of imagining this idea of him and who he could be, as well as the, the, the girl who develops the sort of social media campaign with him. But there's always the Connor's sister who's kind of there and knows the reality. But then we see that this ends up helping her as well, that people imagine him a different way. Absolutely. And, and not just her, but the whole Murphy family. I mean, ev- all that family really needs to uh, believe in the fact that their son um, wasn't uh, as sad as he was. Um, they really need to hold on to that fact that, you know, there were good there were good times, there were good memories, and that his, his life had meaning, and that his life meant something to people. And I think that's true in a case where, you know, you, you look at, you know, family members who lose loved ones, they really need that uh, for their person, that, you know, that their life had meaning, and it's, it's extremely important to them, and I think Evan brings that to the family. So now you're doing eight shows a week, you said. You've been doing this show for three years, give or take, you know, with it changing and developing in different ways. This incarnation of the show, you've probably been doing for, what, like a year and a half? Um, This incarnation of the show, it's really the the closest uh, adaptation to this show uh, was formed at Second Stage Off-Broadway, which we did last year, so uh, spring of last year. So it's probably been about a year, yeah. And about a year. Mm -hmm. When you do a performance, you're doing eight shows a week, does each performance still feel different for you? Or does a lot of times, you know, you finish a performance and it's kind of like, it's like driving to your house or something. You don't even remember how you did it. It's just like, it's over. I understand. Um, you know, it, it really does depend on the show. I've done shows where it's maybe feels monotonous in a way. Um, but something about this show, and I think it really is a testament to the writing that, and it, because I, I think that it is that good, that it, and... It's a reevaluation of the material every time you step on stage, and um, you know it. It is fully it's always sort of peeling back layers for yourself. I think, in a way, you know, it, it's diving further and deeper and exploring more of the character, you know, w- within reason and understanding. I think, you know, that person more, and um, you know, I, I think figuring out ways that an audience can see Connor in a new light but you know within continuing to tell the story the way that it is supposed to be told um it it's a very fulfilling show to do eight shows a week and that's a very rare thing and i'm very very fortunate to be a part of that yeah absolutely you know you said that uh you're not much of a singer i i disagree i saw the show you can he can sing very well uh where did musical theater start for you how did it start yeah well you know growing up i watched um the old mgm films with like gene kelly and you know fred astaire and where was that? In Ohio. Oh, in Ohio. Yeah, I grew up, yeah. It was kind of... Like most Ohio Ohioan kids do yeah. in the 90s. Well, I kind of call it like TV babysitting. My parents were like, oh, you're too hyperactive. Sit down and just like watch this thing. And I was like glued to the TV and I would just watch like this guy dance. And I was like, I need to be like that guy. I want to be exactly like that guy. So it started with dancing for you? Absolutely. And I forced my parents to get me into dance class. But, like, it had to be the right dance class. I couldn't have any girls in it. Uh, only guys, because, you know, I was a kid. I didn't want to catch cooties or whatever. You want to just still maintain a certain semblance of, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you know, childish yeah. masculinity yeah, totally, or something. Totally, 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 yeah. Um, you know, so they found the perfect dance class, and then that branched out. And, uh, what did you learn? What were the first dances that you started learning? Was it, like, tap? Tap. Yeah. Yeah, because I wanted to be like Gene Kelly, so it was, like, tap dancing. Absolutely. Can you still, can you, can you still tap really well? Not really well, no, no, but, you know, I, I can still move, if you will. Um, but, you know, from there, it led to doing children's theater, community theater. Um, grew up doing theater in my high school and just kind of always knowing that theater was going to be a part of my life and something that I, I wanted it. I wanted to be a part of that, and I wanted to move to New York, and I wanted to be a part of the theater scene. And what was the first show that you auditioned for? Uh, professionally. Yeah. Oh, the first show I auditioned for professionally was a show called White Christmas. Um, we all know the movie, maybe. Um, and it was in Springboro, Ohio, at La Comedia Dinner Theater. Um, it was a terrible job. 
I got paid. <laughs> was it? Why is that? I was getting paid like 150 bucks a week. Um, I lived in the back of a McDonald's parking lot. Um, like in a van, or was there an apartment? <laughs> there was like an apartment complex. <laughs> I was in the back of it, you know, and. Uh, but you know, Your house like reek of French fries all the time. Pretty much, yeah. you know, it was pretty bad. Um, but it was, I was a, a professional performer. I was a professional actor, and um, I had dropped out of the conservatory program that I was going to, and I went maybe six, eight months without auditioning for every anything because I felt too incapable. I didn't really want to put myself out there. I was too, too scared, too whatever. And uh, when I booked that, it gave me enough confidence to be like, oh, well, I can actually make this happen. I can actually make this a reality. Um, and that led to other things, yeah. And what was uh, sort of moving to New York? Did you move to New York with a show that you were already going to be doing? No, no. I left, uh, I graduated high school a year early uh, to move to New York because I kind of had to get out. Um, I went to a conservatory program uh, for two semesters, and then I dropped out. I started the conservatory program that June. Um, did you get a roll and drop out? Like did something? No, no, I just dropped out. Yeah, I just dropped out. There was... Um, Good for you. I guess. I don't know. You know, at the Everybody time... Everybody dropped no. Yeah. <laughs> at the time, it seemed like the only option to do. I, I felt as if I had gained enough knowledge and material, and it was so stupid, uh, you know, to say that, because you can never actually, like, learn enough. You continue to learn. You continue to grow. Well, you wanted to work. I guess I felt as if I needed to put it into practical use. Yeah, I wanted to I wanted to take what I had learned, and, you know, I, I, I think what I had realized doing the conservatory program was that every project and every show was going to be different and that there are no right answers and that the you know everybody's kind of making it up as they go and all you can really do is just throw your idea into the hat yeah how did your family respond to the sort of dropping out of the conservatory man my parents are the best they were they really were you know i'm really fortunate in the way that my parents have always been there for me no matter what they have always trusted and supported me and believed in me 100% and um seems that like you the kind of guy though that even as a kid dropping out of the first two semesters of conservatory it's not like ah, i don't want to do this you probably had it pretty well thought out and knew how to sort of pitch it to them or at least convince them that you knew what you were doing. Yeah, I'm able to fool a lot of people. That's why they keep hiring me you for just things. You them yesterday you know? and they're yeah. like, good, go, yeah. you're incredibly <laughs> talented. Yeah, I just keep fooling everyone I meet. Um, no, I I don't know. Yeah, I think, I think that, you know, they knew me well enough that uh, there was a trust there. They, they, you know, they trusted that I was making the right decision for me. And what'd you book? What was the first thing you booked? It was How? that. It was that dinner theater. Then. Oh, no. Af so after you left the conservatory? Yeah, that was the, the first theater. thing. And it was about maybe nine months after I had dropped out of the conservatory program. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you moved to Ohio? In the back of the McDonald's? I, I left Ohio just to go back for another job, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So now with Dear Evan Hansen, obviously Connor and Evan uh, feel like they're outsiders. Connor suffers from uh, depression, as far as we can tell. It's never really defined in the, in the show, which is it's sort of better that way. If it's defined, we could sort of kind of like distance ourselves from it a little bit easier. What sort of research did you do to play, to play Connor, and what were you looking into? Yeah, well, you know, there had been a huge shift in who Connor was throughout the readings and then him coming back. Um, and I was really struggling with trying to figure out this new Connor and who he was. Um, hey, can I ask, how, how a part of all of the shifts in Connor were you? Did you feel like you were a part of those conversations, or would they kind of come to you and be like, hey, we thought about it, we think Connor should go this way? Yeah. The first time uh, they really shifted the idea of it was when we were in D.C., when we were about to do our first production of the show. We had just done a workshop of it, and um, then we got the new script for DC, and there was this new idea. And it was um, daunting. It was, you know, scary, because everything that I had been doing a year, year and a half before uh, had been this one way. And then the tables really turned. And was that one way that we're referring to still like you're just in the beginning of the show, you're kind of a dick, and then... And that, and yeah, then it was it? that aspect of it, yes. And then they, you know hey, let's bring you back. I'm like, have a full-blown relationship with Evan. And um, 
it was it was daunting. It was uh, scary. It wasn't something I was used to, especially I was doing the show for a year and a half before, developing. I thought it was this one thing, and they were like, oh, by the way, it's this now. And, um, you know, so DC for me was a real learning curve, and I never really got a full grasp of what it was what who Connor was um after we did our run in DC I started kind of looking up researching if you will um I had was google searching um suicide survivors and really all I could find were people who uh had lost loved ones to suicide except for this one website and the one website is called livethroughthis.org and it's run by this amazing woman named Desiree and Desiree is a suicide attempt survivor, and now she's in, you know, recovering. And what she does is she is a photographer, and she goes around and she interviews suicide attempt survivors, people who have attempted to commit su suicide, failed, survived. And she goes around and she photographs them, and she interviews them, and she has this wonderful website. And it's their stories; it's these people's stories. And for me, finding that it was extremely influential as to finding out who Connor actually kind of was. Um, and you're fairly committed to live through this as well. If you go see the show, which if you haven't already, you should. It's fantastic. Uh, in the program, you'll see that uh, he has uh, livethroughthis.org uh, listed under his biography there for yeah, something for yeah. people to check out. Well, you know, um, I was reading the website and it really kind of spoke to me and I had to get in touch with her so I emailed her and was like hey you don't know me at all I'm this guy doing this thing could we like have a phone conversation and she was like yeah sure really open to it and I proceeded to kind of you know just ask a bunch of questions and try and figure out and she was extremely helpful and extremely informative um as to who Connor may or may not be. And um, the biggest thing that I had learned was that there is this era of a, a taboo that you know we don't want to affiliate or talk about uh, people with mental health disorders uh, by, any, by any means. You know, we, we really don't want to, we kind of want to glaze over it and move past it really quick. And um, it's, you know, something I think that is really, really important. And I think it's a beautiful, beautiful job how Stephen and the book writers have integrated it within the show without forcing it upon the audience. Well, without defining their characters Very by, nice. by yeah. whichever disorder they might be. And I, I, I think that's fascinating when you say something like whoever Connor may or may not be, because in the, in the beginning of the, of the play, it's left vague. And then throughout the rest of the play, he's really whatever anybody Im imagines him to be. Right. So what did you hang on to in terms of who Connor was? And did you sort of create your own backstory so that you could have an anchor? I mean, the biggest thing that I held on to through reading these, you know, entries was that how they immediately feel uh, displaced and marginalized. Um, you know, the first thing that people are told when they're diagnosed with bipolar disorder is that they're going to be on medication for the rest of their lives. And I think for anyone to hear that, it's like, you're different, and we're going to have to, like, treat you like a different person, and we're going to have to medicate you, or, you know, not, you know, and we're going to, like, we have to watch you. We have to put you in this box. And I think any parent or family member who has a loved one, you know, in that kind of a situation, it's hard to work with that kid. And I th without that person, anyone, really feeling like they're different and, and for the worse. And I think, um, you know, kids are, you know, especially at a developmental stage, you know, in high school and middle school, everybody's kind of got their own baggage and they're all going through their own problems. And humans in general are very lazy and they immediately put people into a box. And I think... That's the biggest thing I took away from Connor, and that's what Stephen has written for Connor in those first, first couple of scenes that he has. You know, he has him very much this way until one scene with Evan where it is attempting to be something different. Um, the biggest thing that Evan and Connor share are the, the lack of security that they can allow themselves to be seen, because if they allow themselves to be seen, then they lose everything. Um, it, 
they lose a piece of themselves. They lose, lose too much of themselves if they really allow themselves to be vulnerable and seen through the other person. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's uh, take some questions from you people. Right here. Hi. Um, I was wondering how the transition between Second Stage and Broadway was, specifically going from such an intimate setting to like this huge Broadway theater and how that worked. Yeah. Um, you know, from Second Stage to Broadway, um, there wasn't too much. Um, there wasn't too much big storyline changes. We basically figured out what we wanted to tell story-wise. There was very minute scenes that were added or elevated in ways, um, maybe musical elements that were out elevated in ways. Really, the biggest transition from second stage to Broadway was it's a bigger space. And it's a grander show now, especially with the technical elements and the, sh the set and everything and filling the space. And you know, there's real aspects of the show where it's extremely intimate and there's nothing going on sta on stage except for the actors. And then there's elements of the show where it does the complete opposite and it's just overwhelming how much the set takes over. Um, and you know, our entire creative team did such a wonderful, wonderful job setting that up. Um, for us as the actors, because there weren't huge developmental changes with the story, we got to really sit with the material for longer without so much changes being made on a day-to-day -day basis. So it was really more developmental for us, uh, getting grounded and understanding the material more. Yeah. Next question. Hi, uh, thanks for being here this morning. Thanks for having me. Um, so my question for you is, right, I mean, before Dear Evan Hansen, you were a part of Newsies, another blockbuster musical. Um, how did Newsies prepare you for this process that Dear Evan Hansen has become? Yeah, um, you know, if any, I mean, obvious things, it's, you know, put me up in a uh, large audience setting. Um, it was doing Newsies, it informed me of what I wanted to do uh, next, which was, you know, t tell stories and tell stories that were uh, with complications and, you know, something that I could, I could really sink my teeth into and tell something a little bit more human. Um, and I wouldn't have really been able to define what it was that I wanted to do, uh, which was a show like Dear Evan Hansen had it not been for Newsies. So that, that was really the biggest thing. Yeah. Having come from uh, a love of dancing initially, is our musical sort of your first love, or is sort of acting in general your first love? Do you are you looking to do a sort of non musical play? Or yeah, like I mean, I, after Newsies, I had done um, some wonderful off Broadway plays and some independent films, and those were um, really kind of me dipping my toes in the water as far as being able to tell a story, really, you know, uh, simplistically in that way without. Um, Song and yeah, say, without yeah. costumes and dancing and singing, and um, it's 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 very thrilling, uh, you know, leaving Newsies and then being an actor. You know, after Newsies, I had booked the agent that I was with, and then I was kind of thrown into the world of it all and doing readings and getting into the ground stages of new shows and like, you know, being in that setting, set, setting, the creative setting where everybody sits around at a table and everyone has their imaginary red pens out and it's like book club almost in a way, you know, and it's, um, you really get the aspect of artists and like what it is to be um, the artistry side of the process with this. And, um, you know, it's a bunch of people trying to fix this problem and, you know, they either do or they don't, or, you know, they got something, some sort of blob on the table, you know, and that's really what interests me the most. How much longer does the uh, original cast have with Dear Evan Hansen, just so people know? Um, you know, the show's doing very, very well. We're selling tickets now through March of 2018. Wow. Um, but I know that for sure you can catch the original cast um, through November of 2017. That's great. I think we have time for one more question. Wait, uh, uh, no, right there. Hey. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having um, me. So if you look at like the history of musical theater and Broadway, there have been really important shows that have sort of made a huge impact on the rest of sort of the future of musical theater. And I feel that Dear Evan Hansen is going to do that. What do you think the legacy of this show will be in 10, 20, 30 years? And what kind of impact do you think it will make on the history? So, wow. Uh, thank you. <laughs> hey, take it away. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know what? What I really find um, about 
what's special with Dear Evan Hansen. For a while with Broadway shows, um, you know, it was very common to do um, movie musicals. It was very common to do jukebox musicals, something that was familiar that can draw in an audience. And, you know, th it was understandably so why they were doing more and more of that because of, you know, the financial crisis and what was going on e economically in America. Now we're at a place where we're a little more stable economically and we're able to take a little bit more risks. What's special about Dear Evan Hansen is that it's an original story. It's not based off a book, it's not based off a movie, it's not based off of anything. And what also is extremely special with it is that seven out of the eight characters that you see on stage, eight shows a week, have been with it for three years. And they have been in the loop developing this thing and creating this thing with the creative team. And um, I hope that, you know, Dear Evan Hansen is a product of that kind of work, that kind of mentality. And I hope that, you know, that continues on. I also think one thing that we're seeing out of theater right now, uh, I mean, specifically in musical theater, is that we're seeing uh, flashpoints in time that are being depicted and sort of held on to. So if Dear Evan Hansen were to be restaged in like 30 years, we would see social media, we would see the way youth responds to Absolutely. social media and the culture responds to mental illness in the same way that in 30 years when Hamilton gets put up, people will think about the fact that Hamilton was staged in 2013 or 2014, excuse me, and what that said about you know, race and how we viewed history. Uh, I think that's kind of the legacy that something like Dear Evan Hansen will give. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Mike, uh, the show is called Dear Evan Hansen. It is on Broadway right now at the music, is it at the Music, music Box, Box Theater? Theater yes. At the Music Box Theater. Through 2018, they're selling tickets, right? Get your tickets, it's unbelievable. Mike Feist, everybody, thank you so much, Mike. Thank you guys, thank you so much. <laughs>